Okay, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be in the book of 1 Timothy, at least for a little bit. Uh, we finished Micah, of course, uh, two weeks ago, and usually at the beginning of the year, I try to do some sermons talking about uh, maybe the fundamentals or the basics of Christianity or some of the um, philosophy of ministry at ICC, making disciples and things like that. But it just so happens in the evening service, we're hitting the qualifications of deacons. And a, a lot of them are similar to the qualifications of elders. So I was thinking, uh, you know, should I just rehash what I said about the elders and see if they were paying attention? And like, oh, it was a great sermon. Well, you heard it three weeks ago. Um, or, um, you know, just, just do something different. Well, as I was, and I don't mind rehashing, but as we were discussing this with the elders, um, the idea talk and the idea of talking about the office of deacon, uh, it seemed fitting, actually, maybe to do that for the morning service. Um, again, not that I mind being redundant uh, on, on the evening service message, but I think it kind of hits that subject of the basics of how ICC operates. And it also gives us an opportunity to hear about some of the basics of Christianity because in the qualifications, you really are hearing some of the basic aspirations for all believers. Doesn't matter whether you're a deacon or even a pastor. Um, we've been saying in our evening service messages for those qualifications of an elder that really they should be aspirations that all Christians, all believers should strive for. So especially also since we're coming up into a business meeting and there's kind of more visibility about those functions in the church and roles like pastor and deacon, I, I thought it might be nice to talk about that and discuss that. Now, uh, just so you all know, here at Irvine Community Church, we have two deacons who have been serving so faithfully, Rich Nelson and David Kingsbury. Uh, they've done a tremendous job, especially in the past year, just trying to help make things run smoothly. Some uh, The elders are very thankful for all that they have done and do, and we're thankful for all those who have served, frankly, as deacons um, very faithfully and well. We've appreciated that, and I've always uh, learned so much from that, and I think we'll see in a minute uh, why what they have done is so critical and so important. Now, I know in the... And they prayed and laid their hands on them, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, this is often called the, the first deacons of the church, or proto-deacons. Uh, and essentially what we have here, let me build the context so that we can understand what it is actually that we see the deacons doing. Again, when you read this, you don't see any explicit definition of, here's a deacon. Um, here's what you should have in your bylaws that say what a deacon is or does. Uh, instead, you have by way of illustration, maybe their role, how they fit in. So the deacons arose primarily out of a need of both the congregation and the apostles. And we see that there was a need that came up amongst the, the people, and there was a need that the apostles saw to appoint a, uh, deacons or these seven men. Now, this is very early in the church's birth. Acts chapter 6 is not <laughs> very uh, far from Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit fell. The, the feast here, uh, or the, the feast that had drawn all the Jews into Jerusalem was called Pentecost. Uh, at the beginning of Acts, you have this feast that all the Jews who could come were supposed to come to. It's one of three feasts that everyone who could come were supposed to come. It's called Pentecost because it takes place 50 days after Passover, and Pentecost is the Greek word for 50. So uh, the Hebrew word for this feast is Shavuot, which means weeks, because it is, uh, I know we're getting technical, but uh, seven sevens after Passover, seven sevens, seven weeks after Passover, you celebrate Shavuot, seven times seven is 49. You include Passover, that's 50. So that's why that that name is what it is. So you have this huge number of Jewish people coming in to Jerusalem. This is the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ, after he's ascended into heaven. And usually what you celebrate at Shavuot or Pentecost was the harvest. And what was going to happen in Acts was a harvest of souls. So as the apostles preached the risen Savior in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised fell upon uh, the people listening, they became disciples of the Messiah. 
and the church was born. Didn't exist until this moment. Now, usually Shavuot was only celebrated for a couple days at most. But that year, something is happening. People were hearing the gospel. People were hearing the fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures. Did they want to go home? No. They wanted to stay in Jerusalem. They wanted to stay and hear the apostles preaching. They wanted to stay with other believers. And so rather than staying a couple days in Jerusalem, they started to stay weeks and even months within Jerusalem. Now, there's a difference if you've ever planned a trip between planning for two days and planning for two months. So many people who are planning just to be there for a few days were now there for longer than that. And that's why you had in the first chapters of Acts all those passages about how they would sell their possessions and have everything in common. It's not that that was, let's say, normative behavior for the church. It's just that here at the beginning where people were, were, were coming from miles and miles away, staying in Jerusalem, who didn't have anything, well, the believers, probably mostly believers who lived in and around Jerusalem, were, were selling their things to accommodate all these believers who had come and to support the apostles and their work. Now, the hardest hit, right, in all of this or any kind of time of need would have been those who don't have much to begin with in terms of provision, in terms of need, and that's widows. Culturally, in those days, widows would be the most destitute. They didn't have a husband to provide and care for them, and especially if they didn't have any children, uh, a, a widow with no children and no husband would be sort of the lowest on the social structure. They'd be homeless and poor, and they were often then a symbol of those who were the lowest of the low in the New Testament. When James talks about what's true religion, it's to help the widow and the orphan, that is to say the, the weakest, the lowest. So by the time of Acts 6, the church in Jerusalem was thousands and thousands of people, maybe even tens of thousands of people. And you had people who were generously giving. The apostles were trying to make sure that the money was being used appropriately. You remember just a chapter before Ananias and Sapphira, they had sold a field and they said, oh, we're giving all of the money to you to use as you will, you know, Peter. But they had pocketed some, which was fine. It's just the fact that they said they gave the whole sum. And so they get struck dead by the Holy Spirit. So it's a very serious thing that's going on here right at the beginning of the church. You already had this kind of like abuse of funds, people giving and lying and trying to make a show of their, of their giving. All that's already happening. You're just months into the life of the church. And so you have a situation come up in Acts 6 that there was this distribution, maybe not of funds per se, but of, of food or clothing or something to provide for the widows. And there's an argument that brews up between two groups within the church at the time, the Hellenists and the Hebrews. What does that refer to? Well, Hellenist means Greek, and these were the Greek-speaking Jews and the Hebrew-speaking Jews that were in conflict. Why was there a conflict? Well, Hebrew-speaking Jews, they kind of looked down upon those Jews who lived abroad. And so their main language, they didn't speak the mother tongue anymore. They spoke you know, they spoke Greek rather than Hebrew mostly. They were those who lived in places like Galilee or Nazareth who were far from Jerusalem. And so they kind of had a snotty attitude towards those Jews who seemed to be worldly and secularized. So there was a little bit of bias against them. Now it's good, of course, that both of these groups of Jews were coming to Messiah. But notice it didn't immediately erase their biases or at least the perceived bias. The Hellenistic Jews felt like their widows and their needy weren't being given provision and benevolence equally to the Hebrew Jews. Oh, we're in Jerusalem, so they're getting favored treatment. Whereas we are the ones who traveled so far to come here to be a part of this moment and we're getting last. So they felt there was discrimination going on, if we believe them, that there was discrimination going on. So it's in that context then Right? So it's a kind of a political context, a theological context, a financial context, <clears throat> that the 12 apostles gather everyone together <coughs> excuse me, to address the issue. Now, in their speech, verses 2 through 4, the word 
diakoneo, it's the verb form of deacon, is used twice. You see it in verse 2 when it says, it is not right that we should give up the preaching, the word of God, to diakoneo, serve tables. Yes. When I'm preaching. What's happening here? What is You're bored of my preaching? You can't say that. You can't say that. <laughs> what <are> you... <laughs> okay. Hey, hey, we have some stuff for you to do, right? Didn't we bring some stuff? Yeah, why don't you go do some of that stuff? Okay. <laughs> I'm bored. <laughs> oh, okay. See, there's a reason to be inside. She would, I don't think she would have done that if she had to go up the stairs to the thing. So maybe we just need a stage or something. Okay, where was I? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, the verb. Yes, the verb. Oh, thanks, Bob. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Serving me. Okay. Uh, diakoneo. So serve tables is that word sir, uh, uh, serve, diakoneo. So it doesn't actually say tables there. It just says we cannot give up preaching the word of God to serve. Now, it's not that the apostles would never, you know, take your plate and put it in the trash or anything like that. It's just the idea that uh, this is a lot of tables to serve, and it would be to give up the preaching of the word to do it. So it doesn't, you know, for, for me to do some stuff around the church, which I do when I'm around here, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take up time, uh, you know, sermon prep time, or it just takes a few seconds, you know, for me to, to, to move things around or a few minutes. It doesn't really take away time, but for them to address this, the apostles, it would have taken away time uh, from them actually pre uh, preaching the word of God. I mean, you just think, Jesus' example, feeding the 5,000, that was like serving, right, tables, except you're in a big field, but he was serving and giving. Did he do that every day? Could he have done that every day of his ministry, just constantly been feeding home, uh, you know, the poor and, uh, you know, the, the widows and orphans? He could have, but that wasn't what his calling was. He could have done that every day, but that was not his calling. His calling was to preach repentance and the kingdom of God and then uh, to suffer and die for our sins. So he himself didn't feed the 5,000 every day, even though he very well could have spent his time doing that. But he was a rabbi. He's a teacher. He's a preacher. And similarly, the apostles, they understood that their task was to do the same. So they say in verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You know what that word ministry is there? Diakonia, deacon. So you see the same word or word family of deacon there when it says we shouldn't stop preaching the word of God to deacon. Rather, our job is to deacon the word of God, you see. And so they saw their a primary task to do that. So what is really the need that gives rise to the deacons? And I, 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 I split this up two ways, okay? There was a logistical need of the church. There was a logistical need for the widows in this particular case to be taken care of. This would involve financial matters of collecting and using the funds that the church members were donating and getting those supplies or provisions for the widows. It probably wasn't just shekel handouts. It was, it was likely in the form of some kind of uh, materials and, and things like that or food. Now, of course, it would also involve the logistical, actual distributing of those provisions. I would think if we're talking about a great number of widows, they would have set up some kind of network of volunteers, or maybe seven of them would have been sufficient to do that. Um, but I, I tend to doubt maybe that if there was, like, say, meal prep involved, that they would actually prepare the meals themselves. I, I'm sure that they were working with the congregation to make sure that... You know, the Hellenists, you know, so you Hellenistic Jews, we will help you to make sure your widows are taken care of so that they were sort of volunteer coordinating. The deacons were also being entrusted to do their service and ministry in, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm skipping ahead there, I'm sorry. So uh, these men then would be like Joseph in Egypt, entrusted with money and property as stewards and not 
seeking to use that position as an opportunity for personal gain or benefit. So there was a logistical need that had arisen in the church, and so the deacons are meeting that logistical need that the the apostles uh, could not or should not themselves meet. But there was more than just a logistical need as well. The deacons were actually providing a, a buffer or being a shock absorber, as uh, Nine Marks puts it. Two ways, actually. They're being a shock absorber two ways. Between the Hellenists and Hebrews, right, the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebrew Jews, and between the congregation and the apostles, So they're providing a buffer, they're providing a shock absorption between two separate groups of people. In other words, there was a need to promote unity and preserve purpose. The deacons were there to be a shock absorber in order to promote unity and preserve purpose. So the deacons were being entrusted to do their service and their ministry in a way that was unbiased, impartial, that promoted peace and unity in a potentially tense situation, either between the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebrew Jews getting to a fight or between the congregation and the apostles, the congregation getting frustrated at certain things in the way they're happening, and they're putting that on the apostles uh, to deal with. So these men had to be men who could empathize with both parties, conduct themselves in an above-board way, avoid accusation of favoritism. In other words, these had to be men who could deal with being in the middle all the time. The deacons also were being entrusted to protect, of course, the apostles' ability to keep on their purpose of preaching and teaching and praying. And it's not that the apostles thought there was no need out there. It's not like they're dismissive of the fact that the Hellenistic widows were not receiving Uh, what they should or that there was bias going on. So it's not that they didn't think there was a real and immediate concern and need, but the idea or the sense is this is actually such a big and important job that it would have taken up, it would have consumed all of the apostles' time to address that. And if they address that, then there's this they also have to address and that, and they could easily just soak up all of their time and energy. Again, even Jesus didn't feed the 5,000 day after day. He did it twice. By serving the congregation then, the proto-deacons, they were also serving the elders. Now, it takes immense character to basically serve everyone and be in the middle like that. And there's an element of of intercession in here that is very Christ-like. Jesus stands between sinners and God. He serves God by serving us. I think actually this is what makes sense when we get there, 1 Timothy 3.13, for those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. It's not said of the elders, it's said of the deacons there in 1 Timothy 3.13. And I think it's because they actually get a greater, in a way, perspective of being Christ-like, being there in the middle, than the, uh, uh, the pastors do in shepherding. And you know, we'll get there, but there's, that's a tremendous statement of the reward for serving well. So, based on Acts 6 and the fact that the New Testament really doesn't define or explain the duties of a deacon, I think we're, we're maybe best left with this idea that deacons stand in the gap. They stand in the gap, both between pastors and congregation and also in between, you know, different needs within the congregation. They're a holy buffer that fills in the needs of uh, the various needs of a church as they arise that neither the people nor the pastors can fill. In some churches, of course, that might be a big job. In some churches, that's a little job, but likely there's a dynamic there where there's seasons of where, where things come up. So some deacon or some churches, they view, because they take Acts 6 very strictly, they essentially just make deacons the, the ones who handle benevolence. But I think it's more the case that this was an occasion. This need of benevolence came up, and that's what brought about the need for an office like deacon, but that, that's not their only job. You know, if there's other needs that had come up, Um, that they would have been asked to do that. It's just this is the first big one that was on the plate of the church. So 
while not all Christians might serve with the title of deacon, I think every Christian should be the kind to see or look for needs in the church and seek to serve in ways big and small. There should be something that, as a Christian, kind of um, resonates with the idea of, of being in the middle, of, of helping these two people, of buffering, interceding, sacrificing. It's Christ-like. It's good. And so whether or not anyone becomes a deacon here, the heart of a deacon, the heart of ministry, the heart of service, I think should tick and beat within all faithful Christians. Now I'm going to set up um, the next week's message, all right, by going to verse 5 or verse um, 3, I'm sorry, and, and looking at what exactly the apostles in Acts 6 wanted, right? So they could have said a lot of things here about how to choose or what to look for or what the deacons need to do, but instead they just give three qualifications. They said, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom. So we won't get into all of those things because I think those three qualities are the ones that get explained in 1 Timothy 3. So I won't get too much into those, but I just want to make this point that the apostles didn't say, look for someone who's good with money. Look for someone who's good with people. Look for someone who is uh, you know, savvy in this or that or the handyman or any of those things. Rather, they said, find people of godly character, of Christian character, full of the spirit, full of wisdom, and have a good reputation. Others, other people will acknowledge, yeah, that, that is someone who actually lives out their Christian life and Christian conviction before the Lord. It's very consistent when you think about it. The apostles, Paul, the New Testament, the Old Testament, God himself, they're all concerned more about the character of a person than what they can do, than their job. They care more about the character of the deacon than a list of the duties that need to be done. I think this tells us something about service in the church that applies to all of us. You might think that there are better ministries and worse ministries to be involved in at a church. That the Lord looks upon some service opportunities and he says, these jobs honor me so much more than those other jobs. You know, if you're really somebody or something, you'd be in this ministry. But we need to understand, God cares less whether you're singing in the band or taking out the trash as he does that when you do it, when you serve, that you do it out of Christian conviction and character. Remember Jesus said that in the kingdom, the greatest will be least, the least will be greatest, the one who's greatest will be servant of all. Heaven will be full of men and women who serve faithfully, quietly, often behind the scenes and in less than obvious ways. Another way to put it is that it's the character and faith of the one doing the task that dignifies the task, that makes it a God-honoring task, that makes it beautiful and significant in God's eyes. It's not the task that makes the person more worthy before God or more holy or more sanctified. A deacon and really any servant of the Lord, they make the task holy or unholy by the faith he or she brings into it. And that's true of every Christian in all that we do, not just church ministry stuff. Whether you eat or whether you drink, what do you do? All to the glory of God. Whether you have a title, like a CEO or president, whether you are just a code writer in some nondescript you know, software company, whether you're a mechanic, a homemaker, a pastor, you bring dignity and worth to it by doing it as a faithful believer by being a man or a woman or a boy or a girl of godly character that's the kind of person that is great in god's eyes regardless of the earthly tasks he or she does that's why when we get to first timothy 3 and the qualifications i think next week those are things all of us should aspire to be 
and want, whether you come to that as a, a deacon uh, by title or not. What are the results? What happens when the apostles make this decision? You look at verse 5. What they said pleased the whole gathering. So the office of deacon is one that not only meets the need, it, it pleases the church that this is being done. And I don't think it's just that they were pleased in the sense that, oh, we got what we want, our widows are taken care of. I think they were pleased also in the sense that and, and our apostles, they can continue to preach and pray. It's not just that they were excited or happy that they, they got something out of, you know, what the deacons were doing, but I think they were genuinely pleased that the apostles could keep preaching. They cared about the gospel. And notice the result. The word of God continued to increase. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. I always thought it was interesting. Why does it say in this particular case that a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith? And, and it occurred to me, and it's, this is a little bit of reading between the lines, but when they saw how the church was operating, when they saw the ministry that was being done by average people. Remember in those days to be a priest you had to be a Levite. You had to be born of a special category. But now they are seeing in the church who could serve? Who could be the buffer? Anybody. As long as you're full of the spirit and wisdom and you had a good reputation. I think in a way they saw that they were out of the job. In a way. Not just by virtue of the gospel's work and Christ being our intercessor, Christ being our sacrifice, but also that they saw they don't need a priest either because look at them. They serve each other. There's no special class or group of people that serve each other. They can serve each other. There's a tremendous statement of oh, the blessing that the deacons can be and are to any church. And so I know it sounds like, and maybe secretly we are, kind of putting this in your mind. <laughs> You know, ways are you looking for ways to serve? We're always looking for deacons, but we'll get to it when we get to First Timothy three. It says they must first be tested, and uh, for us, let's say as elders, we're we're looking for tested men in this way. Are you already serving? Are you already involved? Do you already just see needs and you try to do something about it? That's that's the way that we uh, tend to judge that or or make that test is not by a like a written you know, exam or anything, but just by looking for people who are already serving. And I'll say, Irvine Community Church, so many of you do serve in ways big and small. And I hope you're encouraged at the thought that it's not, it's your faith that makes it something worthy in the eyes of God, not what that particular task is. So whether you're a little boy or whether uh, you are retired, if you do it with faith, it is beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. And we appreciate that and we are whether we acknowledge it or not the lord definitely acknowledge it acknowledges it now what's going to happen next because i kind of uh, messed up the evening service people because i'm doing their their message in the morning tonight we're going to talk about whether women can be deaconesses so i'm going to take the controversial one we'll do it tonight because no one comes and then <laughs> next week all right in the morning <laughs> i'll tell you what we said in the night all right, and we'll talk about the qualifications because there's some qualifications there. It says wives or depending on translation, women, uh, they ought to be these three things. So we'll talk about those because, again, they apply to everybody. Um, but we're going to kind of tackle the, the, the subject of women as deacons tonight. Next week, we'll get into the qualifications, hopefully get through, we'll see, uh, verses 8 through 13 of 1 Timothy 3. But I hope this is an encouragement if you are already serving that the Lord sees it, that, that often the elders do see too, and we appreciate it and it honors him. Um, that if you aren't serving yet, there are always things you can be doing, whether it's like some formal need that we put out on the bulletin. Uh, by the way, we could use more help in the sound room. Um, or ways that we don't see. You know, you just see uh, some trash lying around or you, you notice something um, that doesn't look right. Bring it up to us or bring it up to the deacons and, and be involved in that way as well. So let me pray and then we'll close our time together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the service that you have done for us. Imagine God, most high, being the greatest servant of all, Jesus, who, who came not to be served, but to serve. 
And he is the great ex example that we have, and we are no greater than our master. So if he is one who washed the feet of his disciples, so too, Lord, we are looking for ways to serve this church, to serve each other. Thank you, God, that you would be that kind of God. I can't even imagine that the one who created the sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the trees, life itself, each one of us would also condescend to serve and give to us and sacrifice. I, words are not enough to worship such a glorious creator and king and sovereign. So thank you, God, that we then have the opportunity to serve ourselves. Help us to see the ways that there are to serve and to uh, be involved in ministry. We thank you, Lord, for those who do serve so well and so faithfully, the teams of volunteers, both uh, known by me, I suppose, and, and ones who serve without hardly a word. And I, I pray, Lord, that they would know that their reward does come from you, that you see it and that you will reward it in heaven. God, thank you again for Jesus and his blood shed for sinners, that when, he, when we don't serve, when we don't give the way we ought, uh, oftentimes it is out of selfishness. Um, Lord, we thank you that you can forgive even that. Help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.